Welcome, 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 and one more welcome, maybe two more welcome, welcome to everybody, part of our continuing series. We're talking to professors, reporters, scholars, writers, philosophers, activists, anyone uh, from the left, from the right, we don't care. We just want to get full opinions from thoughtful people directly to you, the public, so that you can do this thing that was popular when I was in high school. It's called thinking for yourself. Maybe it'll come back, maybe it won't, we'll see. With us today, it is our treat, Dr. James Unever. He's from the University of, well, actually, let me get this correct. He is retired professor of criminology <clears throat> from the University of South Florida, and he's a research fellow at the University of Cincinnati Criminology Department. Um, his research generally examines the relationships among race, Racism and crime. His latest research focuses on whether racial and ethnic intolerance predicts punitive attitudes cross nationally, factors related to whether the public wants to get tough on corporate crime, and the relationship between perceived racial discrimination and delinquency. His most recent publications investigate the racial divide and support for capital punishment, progressive religious beliefs, <clears throat> sorry, and support for the death penalty, the relationship between religious affiliation and punitiveness. Colvin's differential coercion theory, the relationship among ADHD, low self-control, bullying, and criminal behavior. Um, he has worked in this field from 2007 to 2020. Uh, he was also a professor of criminology at Radford University uh, and started his academic career in sociology at Duke University. And this is the article that uh, brought my attention uh, to the professor, the real cause of our society's political polarization. But before we get into that, professor, did I get anything wrong with your bio, with your background? Is there something we need to correct uh, about anything? Well, actually, I started working back in 1980. And so I worked uh, 42 years and then I retired. And I worked at uh, Fordham University in New York City and then uh, Radford University in Virginia, Mississippi State. And then uh, I finished my active career uh, at the University of South Florida. And then I retired. And then subsequently I uh, was invited and I accepted a research fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. So that's kind of, kind of where I'm hanging out now, so to speak. So I've been at it a long time. It's a little bit longer than 2007, so. And is it fair to characterize, I'm sure not all of your research, but a lot of your research has to do with the nexus of uh, race and criminology or, or Yeah, I, I would consider prejudice myself and... one of the um, experts in the United States on race relations within the United States. So, and I essentially looked at race and uh, in the context of crime in a variety of ways. And uh, my last uh, couple of publications, uh, I advocated that to truly understand the causes of crime, that you have to separately look at blacks and whites um, because the causes of their crime uh, are unique to each group. Mm. And then, uh, so I wrote a book called uh, 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 Black Criminology, and which I advocated for a whole new field within criminology called Black Criminology. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it, not that you want to get into that so much, but I'll just briefly say that almost the entire field of criminology advocated for or that the causes of crime for blacks and whites would be the same, like poverty. But I, av I advocated that that idea of what they call racial invariance is fundamentally wrong. And I debated professors from Harvard, et cetera, about it. And so I argue that the experience of being black in the United States is unique and that the causes of their crime are related to their uh, experiences as being a black person in a racist society. So it's, it's one of my major contributions. So this, this article was a spinoff of all the research that I've been doing on, on race relations. Wow, that's fascinating. That's, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, we got to stay focused. I want to ask you so many questions about uh, BLM, Trayvon Martin, Etc. But maybe for another time, uh, let's go to the article. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is the real cause of society's political polarization. Wh why did you write this article? Why did you think it was a good idea to write this article and why now? And I, I know the 
I have a good idea of the answers, but if you could uh, talk to the person watching this video as if they've been in a cave for the last 10 years. Um, you what's may, going on in America? Everything's yeah. totally cool. There's no problems or things are ripping themselves apart at the seams. Uh, what's going on? Why did you write this article? Well, are, are you in California? Yeah. Okay. So you really don't know exactly why I wrote that article. I wrote that article because I, I was in Florida. And okay. the, if, if you look at the news, your governor and I, and my governor, not my, in the possession, but right. uh, are ready for a uh, uh, a cage match. I mean, they're basically fighting at one another. So your experience of what's happening is, is if you wish, politically a far cry, maybe even the opposite of what's happening in the state of Florida. So uh, we're not all Americans who have the basically the common universal culture that effervades all 50 states. Uh, not not recently. Uh, you know, after DeSantis became governor in his landslide election, uh, he's declared a war on woke. Uh, and so that that article that I wrote was a series of editorials that I've had published that have dealt with different dimensions of the Sant DeSantis war on woke, which is, in a sense, a, a direct war on James Unifer, me. <clears throat> Oh, you interpret the war on woke as a war on you. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because my area of research was critical race theory. And even though uh, it's now in the courts and it's not clear whether or not it will be overturned in his stacked uh, appeals court, it would be, if you wish, illegal for me to teach what I've always taught for the last 42 years. So uh, I don't believe, Marcus, you have that experience in the state of California, but we uniquely uh, in the state of Florida, he has outlawed discussions of systemic uh, racial oppression. So I consider it a personal war on me personally, because that's my area of expertise. And he's just basically declared me null and void. So um, I, if you wish, I had no choice but to start to publish these editorials to present a different um, alternative for people to frame their arguments in terms of what DeSantis has been doing in terms of his war on woke. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question, because <clears throat> uh, it sort of relates, but Barack Obama was elected president. Two terms. Professor, we're a post-racial society. America elected a black man as president twice. That means all of America can't be racist anymore. Right? Yeah, you know, it's really uh, in the second to last book I wrote, which is a theory of, of uh, why blacks commit crime. Uh, the, the entire focus of that book was their experiences with racial discrimination, which I said earlier was their experience of what it means to be a black person, particularly a black man, living in a racist society. And I, I, I was writing this book, and then I realized, well, wait a second. Some people, white people, white men probably even more than white females, may actually believe that we are in this Barack Obama post-racial society. That's so what I read on TV? basically write an entire chapter, which was almost an aside to the purpose of the book, describing uh, the experiences of racial discrimination and providing um, all sorts of data to show that racial discrimination exists. So this idea that because we elect, elect one black person, and don't forget he's running against a failed president of Bush, that somehow or another, he his election has eradicated the systemic racism that is endemic to the United States it is only a myth that very few people probably believe in their heart, especially when those people may even know what the word the N word means. So I, I, I will um, I will agree with you now. I remember when Obama was here. Everybody in California was drinking that Kool-Aid. 
oh, racism is it's it's over. It's gone. I remember there was a lot of people saying that newspapers saying that professors saying that politicians saying that up and down spectrum. Everybody was saying that now it seems obvious now. The critical this question is 15 Mark, years ago. Black saying that. Uh, I saw a lot of people of many different colors saying it's it's you know a new days here. We're turning the tide. You know it's all over. It's all fixed. And then we had. I did, a, I did a paper on blacks' attitudes after uh, Obama's uh, election, and they did see, if you wish, a um, sparkle of hope. But actually, they perceived that Barack Obama would not substantially or substantively make any real difference in their lives, particularly when it came to criminal justice related issues. So they saw his election more, if you wish, in terms of what's called symbolic politics than in terms of altering their real life conditions, uh, especially as they interact with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> wow is that why and i don't want to get too uh down this path but i remember i remember noticing um blm when it started to get going and it seemed to be after obama was president and i kept thinking it, there was a president who was african-american for two terms how come he didn't fix everything like why do you have to have a movement about fixing racism and, and criminal justice that starts up after the president unless maybe people felt the president didn't actually do it. Well, you know, it was really interesting because uh, Barack Obama in his first term and three quarters of his second term, um, you know, kind of was race neutral. And he wanted to present that as as yeah. he was about. Yeah. And it wasn't until he was out of the reelection picture that he actually and he was the first president to ever do so. He went to a prison. I saw that. And yeah. And so and then he talked about, you know, the, the racialization of crime. But you have to understand that at that point, it was at no risk for him in terms of his own personal uh, reelection. And or if you wish, he it wouldn't have interfered with his agenda for how he wanted to uh, uh, put forth his programs, which by and large, like I said, were race neutral. So he knew all along, and when he had the beer in the garden, and he, he actually said, "Thank God it could have been me," you know, uh, who and you know the Harvard professor Gates that was arrested on the court, yeah. yeah. Um, and Trayvon Martin also, but so he, he like purposely uh, did not address the race issue, and I bet you if you interviewed him, or he may have said somewhere else. That he didn't do so because he knew that there would be such a strong backlash, i.e., the war on woke, that it wasn't worth him doing so at the expense of everything else he wanted to accomplish, such as Obamacare. Right, right. But certainly, there's many calculations as president. How polarized our society is along race. If the president who's black can't be black and have a race agenda that specifically targets, uh, if you wish, the betterment of only black people, that by definition, I think would hope, I, I would hope your audience would say, well, gee, I guess the reason that he couldn't do that is because he would suffer a backlash from white people, which by definition means that racism is alive and well. That's a good point. That's a great point. If Obama came in and if he solved racism, then why wasn't he able to talk about racial issues until he was almost completely out of office? Right. Like you said, like that's the lame duck term of the president. You've you're in your second term and you're in your last two years of your second term. You're basically you're almost meaningless because they're already looking at the next president. I'm not saying that he was, but in political history, et cetera. So and then that's when he goes, OK, now I can finally talk about race issues that the the first minority non-caucasian president knew he could not talk about race issues although he was an epitome of them until he was almost out of office is that is that what you're saying we're, we're that's the kind of america we I lived think in, it was in the latter half of the two last two years too it wasn't right. like it wasn't like year three it was like i can't tell you specifically but it was probably post year three yeah he finally went into that prison so i applauded him 
when he did so, but it was a little too little, a little too late. And he couldn't address these issues earlier because he knew the country was too polarized on race already. Yes. And, wow. and you have to, you know, the one thing, Marcus, too, I would say is that, you know, I, I have to applaud um, uh, the conservative movement in, in that. And I would also, if you were single out a guy that has been in the Florida news uh, prominently, a, a guy named Chris Rufo, Christopher Rufo. Um, uh, there's a college that's a half a block from my house that was has been taken over by the conservative movement. Uh, and Christopher Rufo is now on the uh, board of directors, the board of governors or whatever you want to call it for that university. And if, if you think about it, I think it's rather incredible and also incredibly insightful that the Black Lives Movement uh, spurred, uh, just exploded on the scene where all of a sudden everybody, including white people more or less, had to recognize that this guy is kneeling on this guy's neck until he's dead. And he's one's white and one's black. But two years later, I can't speak, nor can I talk about, if I was working in the state of Florida, critical race theory. So you have to you have to be amazed, absolutely good point. Absolutely amazed. Good point. At how how resistant whites are to any gain that blacks may be achieving. And those gains were actually in the state of Florida being institutionalized because during the the the, the apex of the Black Lives Matter movement. They were institutionalizing new laws in the state of Florida where universities had to create diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, et cetera. And now, how long is it now? Three years later at the max, they are now also illegal and they're being made illegal across the entire, not in cross, but across every red state in the United States. They're all attempting to abolish it. So once again, is race an irrelevant issue? Are we blind? Are we truly colorblind? Well, how is it possible that within two years after blacks made a striding gain to achieve some equality within the criminal justice system that my data showed that is the most resistant to, to change, when they attack that very issue, now it's a law and order issue. We need to fund more police, even Biden's equivocating on that. So you have to give them, I, I can't tell you, what an achievement for Christopher Rufo to somehow or another in his clever elitist way to have outlawed the discussion of critical race theory within years after the Black Lives Matter movement came on and made a, a true effort to change the dynamics of race relations in the United States. Well, obviously it's a reaction, right? Yep. Just like One Blue Lives Matter is a reaction to Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter is a reaction. I mean, they weren't doing that until one of them. You can see this with the two parties. One does something and the other reacts. And then yeah, but this it's, reacts not one step back. it's not even one step forward, one step back. We are one step forward and now it's illegal for university professors and for corporations now to even do any diversity inclusion training. So we haven't just gone back one step. No, no, no. We've gone back a decade, three decades, back to the point where you can't even talk about these issues any longer. So, uh, I mean, you talk yeah. about you know, polarization uh, and how, to, how is that polarization being orchestrated? How uh, well, all happen? I want to get to that. I want to get to that. Let me uh, just make a few comments. Um, we were talking about George Floyd when you were mentioning the man uh, with the police officer. I think Derek Chauvin, Chauvin uh, murdered George Floyd by applying too much pressure on his neck for too long and uh, cutting off uh, oxygen flow to the man's brain. So um, I was proud. How do I say this the right way? It's very morbid. But I was the only one of my friends who go, that guy was killed. When they showed the video, they were still saying, oh, he was knocked out and he died later. And I'm like, no, he's dead. He's murdered right there. The way the body is moving was, 
I just, the way the body was positioned, I'm like, no, that guy was murdered. And I called it and it was like, no, 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 Mark, you can't say that you're, you're going to make it worse. And people are going to get upset. And I go, he was murdered on, no, 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 no. He was unconscious. That's what the cop said. And then a few days later, the next day he died. And I'm like, no, no, no. And then it came out a week later. And I'm like, I called it. I called it. I said right up front when nobody wanted to hear it, he's murdered. And there was immediate pushback from my friends and family. Like, whoa, whoa, you're going to, you're going to make it worse. But I'm sorry. The guy got killed. I, I, I didn't make that happen. Let's just talk like, about yeah, reality. Is racism alive and well? I, you know, that's, that's my question a, to you, Professor. It's a micro, what, what in the literature they call microaggression, when your friends say, oh, Marcus, calm down. Don't talk about it in, in an inflammatory way. That's what's called racism. And that's that means that you can't speak the truth about what happened to that man because, quote, it'll be upsetting to who? White people. Or maybe even some Latinos, I don't know. But the reality is that that pushback that you got, again, is a definition of racism. And could you only imagine if you were black and you were voicing those opinions around white people, the subtle ostracism, you're an angry black man. Exactly. Discuss those issues. Calm down, Marcus, please take it easy. You're, you're really inflammatory right now. Let's just let the criminal justice system work itself out. I.e., Marcus, shut up. Don't talk about race. Don't, inf don't be an advocate for racial justice. <clears throat> and you right. may interpret it as subtle, but that's not, you know. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. And coercive. if you compare it to January 6th, all the same people who told me to calm down about George Floyd, they were all up in arms on January 6th. Nobody was going to tell them, calm down about what you saw on January 6th. Hell no. It's, that's logic. That's facts. What are you doing? You should be upset too. Right. And so I can totally see where January 6th, good reason to be upset. George Floyd, calm down. Calm down. Same thing. January yeah. 6th was a reason to be upset. I, think I saw George three Floyd blacks in that. Upset. I maybe saw three blacks in that January 6th insurrection. I, 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 th I saw one guy. Um, <laughs> it's not like it wasn't a racial issue in terms of black. Want, you know, well, let's let's get to the meat. And well, first, let me point this out real quick. I, I do want to get some of my accolades because people are always like, you sound like a Republican. I'm, I'm a liberal. Um, I remember when Obama was president and they were saying post racial society and I had predicted he wasn't going to win. And all my friends made fun of me. And I go, America's still racist, bro. I had family in Texas. So everybody was telling me Obama's going to win because America's not racist anymore. And I knew that wasn't true. And so I incorrectly said Obama's going to lose because, you know, th this country's still racist. And for eight years, I was laughed at. But then when Trump came, Nobody was laughing about how I said America was still racist, even though they elected Obama. Like suddenly it, it came back in a resolution very quickly. Right. Uh, some of the things I pointed at was 9-11 had just happened. They had a 9-11 movie about the 9-11 attacks. Um, there was a African-American army sergeant or Marine sergeant who was there at 9-11 and was pulling people out of the rubble. They had a white man play him in the official 9-11 movie. No one said anything, no complaints. And this is when we have the first African-American president. We accidentally have a black man portrayed as a white man in a major motion picture about a national event. Ax just an accident, just, just an accident that one of the most key significant black people who was there on the ground on 9-11 in the dust, risking his life to help fellow Americans, not saying I'm a black man and that's saying I'm an American and I'm here to help fellow Americans. Are you white? Are you black? Are you? I don't care. I'm helping people out of the dust. I'm exposing myself to dust. I don't care because I'm a soldier and I view this as my duty. And right. I don't even get the recognition of my race in the official movie from the country I served on 9-11 while the president's also black. I and I go, well, that's that's odd. Isn't, oh, no, just an accident, just a pure accident. And I'm like, we talk about 9-11 all the time, and all you guys forgot that this army sergeant was black when you're making the movie? I mean, there's pictures of him everywhere. You, right. you, didn't, you didn't research 9-11 when you're making a movie about 9-11? And then I also remember there was a, I think he was a CEO of Time Magazine. 
um, or a major magazine did not like Obama and referred to him as a tar baby on TV. And right. they basically let that go. And I was like, and, you know, and then there was also the Southerner who interrupted him during the presidential address, which hasn't happened in 200 years, saying, you lie. And I'm like, those little things don't say acceptance to me. I understand he won the election, but I'm noticing little things. Also, the Miss America pageant, two of them. People say, oh, Trump made America racist. And I'm like, really? Because in um, there was one Miss America who was of Lebanese heritage. And then two years later, there was another Miss America who was of Indian heritage from India. This is while Obama's president. New America, right? They, they win the Miss America pageant. Both times, the media has to talk about how there's so much backlash and so many people going online and saying, why don't they put a cloth on their head and get back to the Middle East? Because they can't be an American. All right. These girls were born here, raised here talk like American girls, dress like American girls. The only difference was their skin was not white. You're a foreigner. And then I also remember this is while the birther conspiracy with Obama's going around. And I'm like, folks, I don't see, this is not what's happening if we're moving to a post-racial direction. We should not have half the country revolt because Miss America looks brown and has heritage outside of Northern Europe. And yet that happened twice in a row while Obama's president. And I understand he was kind of, um, he, he was a uniter. He tried to bring the country together. I totally get it. But I, I think one of the things he did was he didn't talk about race issues enough while they were happening. And he was trying to bring the country together. That's a political decision on his. But I could also see it developing. And I'm like, you know, this is going on and we're not calling it out. So my question to you is, um, there are some people who say we had the 60s revolution in the 1960s. Hey, we have to accept minorities. And the theory was that everybody in America basically was going to get with the program eventually. Now I'm seeing another theory that goes like this. The 1960s happened. It was the ethnic revolution. And then the 1970s was a backlash to that, the counter revolution by conservatives. And basically there's a section of the country that said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to join the diversity crowd. Uh, I'm going to figure a way to isolate myself, pull out, segregate myself. There's a concept called the big sort. Uh, it was written by Bill Bishop. It goes says starting in 1992, roughly people started segregating themselves into ideologically like-minded communities. And the conservative communities are all white, mostly male, no youth, no minorities no LGBTQ, all watching Fox News. And every year the country gets more polarized into these two different camps. Does it make sense to you that America never got over racism in the 1960s and we're still having people basically not wanting to integrate and that that is the reason for why we still see so much polarization? Well, I mean, I think the most interesting question uh, is why now? You know, why why is Trump getting any kind of uh, legitimacy? Um, why are people siloing away in their little social media uh, microcosms? And, you know, I, I would say that the larger, which I didn't talk about in this particular editorial, but if you look at What's happening now for this backlash? You know, what, what gives the context for Christopher Rufo? What gives the context for Trump? What gives the context of uh, a Donald Trump? And there is no doubt that white people are fundamentally aware of, in the aggregate, never less on an individual level, that their um, control over the United States is being weakened. And they are fully aware, and they look in their neighborhoods that there's this large Latino group, there's Asians. And the bottom line is they are also fully aware, I believe it's already true for the state of California, that whites are going to be in a minority already are 
a statistical minority. Of course, minority doesn't mean minority in terms of power. But if you ask, if you have to ask this question, how did this blowback against uh, the Black Lives Matter gain so much traction? It, it's the larger context of white people knowing that that they are no longer going to be the person that's going to define the cultural hegemony of the United States. They will no longer fully control the economic institutions. And minimally, they're going to lose probably a lot of ground, which they've lost already at the state and federal political levels in terms of the politics. So the whites may still own Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Tesla, et cetera, but the erosion is systemic. And there isn't a white person, at me being a white person, that fundamentally isn't aware of the fact that my ability to walk around with a sense of arrogance and be unquestioned is no longer present. And so that, that gives the context in which uh, you can get a Christopher Rufo and have critical race theory made illegal in the state of Florida because white people in general, but there's a little bit more to it on a more pragmatic level. So that, that's in the aggregate. In the aggregate, there isn't a, a white person that knows, and then you go on Fox and, you know, from what I understand is that these people on Fox are saying that white people will be replaced. Well, that's the exact same thing that I'm saying is that white people feel that their hegemony over the, you know, over the United States isn't going to be what it was, isn't going to be what it is right now. And so that intensifies the systemic nature of racism and, if you wish, um, uh, the antagonism of other groups because they're being systematically attacked. And, I, and that's only from a conservative point of view from every angle right now. We have the Latinos that have taken over the state of California. I can't wow. even go to a bathroom now without knowing whether I put the toilet seat up or down. It's driving me crazy. Then in addition to that, I got you know African-Americans demanding to defund the police and the police are the only thing that protects me from African-Americans. So you gotta understand, you gotta understand Marcus, things are getting out of control. And so us whites have to need to do what? We got to find a champion. We got to find a leader. We got to find someone that's going to somehow or another save us from the chaos of these, of these groups nipping at my heels, taking bites out of my calf, maybe even at one point going for my juggler. And I can't, I'm not going to put up with that, Marcus. I'm going to rally around someone that's going to stand up and restore America and make it great again for white Americans. And we know um, what that's going to be. Yeah, I, uh, I do want to ask you a question, quick story. I'm in Fresno, I'm in the Central Valley, and we've been a majority minority place for like 10, 20 years. So we're, we're even further ahead of California. Although we're a little right. bit more conservative, we're in the Central, but demographically we're even further into the future than where California is. So California is like 50% Latin others. And in the Valley, it's like 60, 70%. So I was hanging out with my friend and he's Caucasian, um, Germanic. And we went by, we were driving by something and the sign was in Spanish and he goes, oh, let's stop by and get tacos. That looks like a good deal. And I go, where'd you see that? And he's over there and he points to the Spanish sign. I go, and I'm half Mexican. I go, how do you know that? And he goes, I live in Fresno. I've lived here my whole life. Looking at me like, what do you think? I'm I'm white and I don't have the uh, I I don't need to speak Spanish. I get that I'm a minority here. I need, but he wasn't he wasn't um, horrified by it. It was just right. kind of like a funny concept. And I also have uh, relatives in Texas, and I have met many conservatives across America who are genuinely scared. Uh, total opposite, just genuinely scared about they're losing their place. Correct. My my question for you is. Before uh, Trump was elected, I wrote an article and it got published in a uh, small journal called Racial Inquiry. And I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. OK. And I was still saying America is going to become way more racist no matter who wins. 
I had no idea Trump was going to win. I had no idea about January 6th and Charlottesville, et cetera. And I was already saying America is going to be more racist, even if Clinton wins, because I was pointing at there were these things that kept happening through the Obama administration, like the two Miss America pageants. Uh, there was also polling in 2015 that showed that um, a lot of people were OK with attitudes towards Latinos that resembled what Trump was saying. So he came in 2016, but a lot of stuff he was saying was sh showing up in polls in 2015 when Obama was there. There is a theorist called Norman Ornstein. Norman Ornstein works at the American Enterprise Institute. He's looking at census data, U.S. census data, demographic data. And what he's saying is you have about 35 states now that are 30, 40 percent of the population but they control kind of the government. That's why we get presidents that aren't popularly elected. These 35 states are majority white, mostly male, no minorities, no gay people, no immigrants, no young people. So it's mostly old white people in a very rural thing without any diversity who watch a lot of Fox News. And he was saying that the U.S. Census, the census is saying that trend is going to continue for the next 20 years to the year 2045 or roughly about the time that NASA says we'll have a fully working colony on Mars. So does that make sense to you? You got 35 states in the Midwest. Minorities are leaving. Youth are leaving. Diversity is leaving. We're getting kind of a hollowed out, rural, hardcore, old, white, super conservative thing. And the demographic trends so that that's not going to change or get better for right. the next two decades. Um, it's just in the Midwest, I would say rural parts of the South or, you know, Atlanta is a far different cry than, you know, further south in the state of Georgia. So, uh, you know, you may have pockets of uh, urban, urban pockets that maybe have some progressive uh, leadership. But in the rural areas, it's, you know, where racism was most systemic to begin with in the first place. Right. It, 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 you know, so I don't know whether minorities are leaving these rural areas. I would probably suggest that they were never there much to begin with in the first place. So, um, you know, that that's that's part of the issue. But again, it's like, you know, just to go back to the purpose of the article is that, you know, racism is systemic in the United States, which means that it's basically institutionalized, like they just had to report in the Minneapolis Police Department showed that what Chauvin did was, you know, he had done it 19 times previously. So, uh, and nothing, he, he was never held accountable. And so, you know, essentially we are no longer, we're in a post-racial society is when you make a racial joke and all your friends report you and, and hold right. you accountable. And we're not there, we're not anywhere close to being there. Instead, everybody will start to laugh and enable your own racism hardly anybody it's like with bullying you know when kids get bullied everybody else just stands and watches so you know when it comes to racism we are truly in a post-racial society first off when no one says it but if someone does say something that has an implication of being racism he loses friendships and he's divorced he's ostracized we're not at that point we're not going to be at that point for a long time so the you know the purpose of this article was to say okay i didn't really get into it but you have this systemic nature of racism that's been with us since we're the only country in the world that the constitution condones slavery so you know it's practiced everywhere else in the world but it was legally enshrined as being acceptable only within the united states so it's systemic because it was part of our u.s constitution so then the question becomes well, what's intensifying this polarization, given the, um, uh, you know, the background that I described earlier, that whites are feeling as though their hegemony is diminishing, is that the purpose of this article was in part twofold. Number one, I, I talked about conservative Ivy League elites. Right. And I did that on purpose, Marcus. So I'll share this with you just between us. I did that on purpose because, in fact, it's true. But most importantly, because the only time I ever hear the word elite, it comes from the conservatives 
who talk about how the uh, liberals are led by these elites, implicating right. that they are Ivy League trained, uh, kind of think they know what's best. Ivory Tower. Yeah. And so they, they kind of make it look like that uh, a progressive person isn't progressive because of their own morality or ethics, but because they're being led around the nose by someone that's telling them how to think about liberal, uh, about issues uh, from a liberal perspective. But the reality is that the conservatives, Trump included, almost every, I read George Will's column in today's newspaper. He got a PhD from Princeton. DeSantis got a degree from Harvard. Ann Yell, Rufo's got a degree from Harvard. So, so all, the, all the folk yeah. that are defining what it means to, or if you wish more simply, creating the conservative narrative, the anti-woke message, no diversity, equity, and inclusion. Every one of those, Cruz, all those folks, you're, you have relatives in Texas, all those folks are Ivy League right. trained. And so the reason I started out that editorial by saying conservative elites is, listen, you are being led by Ivy League elites. Joe Biden is an Ivy League. So, you know, don't don't use that word elite unless you're going to understand that you in your party, the, the entire entire narrative of what it means to be conservative today is being defined by people graduating from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Cornell, et cetera. <laughs> And that was one of the reasons I did that. And to be quite honest with you, I, that pisses them off more than anything else because they don't like the idea that they also have Ivy League people telling them how to behave and think. Counter narrative. It's opposite right. the narrative they want to push for their side. Yeah. And why are they pushing that narrative? Now, I, on an ethical level, the narrative that I argue for in my editorial is that these folks, these Ivy League trained individuals, are pushing a narrative that is causing the polarization of our country. So I'm not attributing it to the social media. I'm attributing it to, they are fully aware, all these Harvard trained individuals are 100% aware that this country has fundamental racial fissures and so instead of trying to heal those fissures that, if you wish, Obama clumsily attempted to do, they're exploiting those fissures for their own personal political gain. So that how do they, how do they increase the polarization of our country is, for example, by outlawing critical race theory. So it's, wow. no, it's no longer so that these folks are telling you it's immigrants. They're telling you that before you know it, you're going to have to use pronouns on your signature on your email. They're telling you that black people are trying to defund the police and that crime is getting out of control. There's homicides everywhere. So what they're doing, and the Latinos, what are we going to do with you guys? We're going to build a wall to keep the flood from happening. It's not Thank that you. The, the Mexican horde from coming. Yes, the Mexican horde. A lot of these Latinos are coming across like, like water over a dam. And so we got to basically, I know you're scaring me right now. So what we ultimately have to do is, so these politicians are understanding. <laughs> and here's the irony of it all. Back in the Reagan day, this is one of the most interesting things that I didn't have time. And, you know, these editorials are so condensed. One of the most interesting studies I ever read in academia uh, was by Kinders and Sanders out of Michigan. And they asked the question, why did union voters vote for Ronald Reagan? And the irony, of course, was I, I, I don't know if you remember or not, but the first thing that Ronald Reagan did was abolish the air traffic controllers union. Right. So the fundamental question is, why would someone vote for somebody that's going to, to uh, uh, subtract from their economic viability? 
And what did their research find? Their research found that whites, particularly white males, voted for Reagan because they perceived that if Reagan didn't get elected, that the government, I forgot who Reagan, who is he running against? I forgot. Uh, Dukakis or one of the. Uh, uh, Mondale the second time and um, uh, the governor from the South, who's not seen as a very good oh, president. No, no, no. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I for, okay, I forget. But in any event, what this research showed is that white male voters, females less so, would rather vote for someone that would undermine their economic position, i.e. wouldn't make their wallet fatter if they perceived that that president would not push policies that advanced another group, i.e. more specifically blacks at their expense. Sure, the, it's sort of the short way to say this is they would rather be poor than have a black be in a position of telling them how to run their life. And so that is the strategy that became a fundamental part of the Republican strategy that turned the South from Democrat to Republican. It's called the Southern strategy. Right. Billy Horton commercial being the pinnacle with Lee Atwater confessing on his deathbed how he regretted making that commercial because it was inflammatory on racial issues. He lied. He lied. So the bottom line is Republicans, these guys, these Ivy League trained elitists are fully aware, Marcus, that the blue collar worker isn't as concerned about it, an issue that will make their wallet fatter than they are. They're more concerned about affirmative action or quotas or those kinds of policies that ultimately would cause blacks to potentially rise above the socioeconomic position of whites. So now Republicans, Ivy League elites, fundamentally know how can I get white male voters to vote for me? I remember I uh, learned recently um, that Ronald Reagan's first campaign stop I think it was in South Carolina or someplace in the deep South where the uh, poll workers who came to register black voters got killed. And that's where he announced his presidency was in a place where Southerners who were racist had killed Northerners trying to register uh, blacks. I, I was surprised that I didn't know that he didn't draw a lot of attention to it, but he absolutely did it on day one. And it's like, right. well, what does that signal? Well, well, why would you do I'm, that? I'm declaring a war on woke. Yeah. Yeah. Why would a you? Yeah. It's another version of a war on woke. So these yeah. politicians, what's causing the polarization in the United States is conservative Ivy League Republican elites playing the race card. It's as simple as that. So that and they have legitimated white people having animosities to other groups, whether and particularly, if you wish, towards blacks. And so they're, they're, they didn't create the racial division but they are fully aware and fully understand that it could work to their, to their election because it will generate votes if they advocate that these groups will not diminish your overall social status within the United States of America, you will vote for them. And so there are a lot of white people that have racial animosities or homophobic, et cetera, that gravitate to that message and these people are called the base. Right. Why? <clears throat> um, right. And, and just for everybody listening, um, Atwater was an advisor to Reagan and he, uh, Bush, 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 Senior. Bush Senior, and he advised him to make a commercial, I believe uh, the, it's called the Willie Horton commercial. And basically it was people being released from prison and the one guy who's black stops and looks right up at the camera. And the idea is, watch out, this black man's going to get released from prison and come and get you in your house. And the guy and, did commit crimes when he was released. Yes, and he did commit crimes. Uh, so it was definitely play on racial fears. And Atwater was a racist, although he uh, pretended not. I, I have a question, but I, I want to say one thing real quick. That I was, was, was a Republican. 
I quit in 2012 because I thought the party was turning white nationalist. So I see Romney come on TV and go, my God, Donald Trump's racist. We would never tolerate that in the Republican Party. And people seem to celebrate him. And the issue was, is that I quit the Republicans because I felt Romney was racist in 2012. Basically, Romney has ties to Mexico, partially grew up there, speaks fluent Spanish, has family members there from his Mormon heritage, wouldn't speak Spanish or mention any of it during his entire campaign. George W. Bush, say what you will about him, had 50 percent of the Latino vote. Romney dropped that down to 20 percent within two years. So I knew white people were running out of bodies. They were going to have to start bringing in brown people to have simply numerical support, superiority to win elections. I was sure it was going to go that way. Bush was a sign of the times. Uh, say what you will. I have many criticisms with him. But Romney turned it 180 degrees the opposite. He said, no, we are not reaching out to Latinos. We will not be speaking Spanish. We will not mention any of my ties to Mexico. We will not say anything positive about them. And we're going to drive that percentage down when we can't afford to lose it from 50 to 20 percent. And I go, the only way that's going to work is if you said, I'm betting on white nationalism as our campaign strategy in the future. I knew that. And I had no idea Trump was going to be elected, but boy, did I call it right. Because four years later, here comes Trump. And so when I see Romney going, Trump's an aberration. We, we, he's, oh my God, the racism of this man. Kind of fake, right? I mean, they've been toying around with these themes for a while. This isn't, Donald Trump wasn't the first Republican to ever do a, uh, uh, outreach to racists, right? Or is that, or, or racism never existed in the Republican Party and they never hinted at racism before Donald Trump and he alone came and changed everything? No, that's not true. I mean, like we said, it, it, it's the Southern strategy. At one point, the whole South was Democratic and now they're they're entirely Republican. What, what, how did that happen in a relatively short period of time? And was it an economic issue that transformed them? Or, you know, how the South is economically gaining in comparison to the other parts of the country. So it, it, it clearly was, you know, an orchestrated playing the race card by conservative. You know, Bush is a, if, if you, the family has got a beautiful house up there in Massachusetts. Right. It, it is a very, they, these folks, unfortunately, because of what's now what we're, finding is we can't even talk to each other. They put in motion a long time ago the policies that are were going to increase the polarization of our country. And now you have a Trump and a DeSantis that understand a cruise that understands that this is the way that we can get elected because the you know the blue collar worker isn't that deeply concerned about pocketbook issues. You know, it's it's not what's driving them right now, and so, you know, it's 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 incredible that someone would consciously do this. But like I said, the guy that made that racist commercial, Lee Atwater, when he was on his deathbed, confessed about making that commercial and knowing that he was playing the race card. So I guess we get honest when we get close to meeting our maker, and he knew what he was doing. And, you know, now he has to live with the repercussions of that and wherever he may find himself. But the bottom line is this has been a policy, but it's become particularly because of this larger context, a viable, more overt because of the shrinking sense of uh, being replaced, it'll sell. And again, it, I give them credit. Two years, three years after uh, George Floyd was murdered, I can't talk about critical race theory any longer in a classroom. And uh, it's an incredible, incredible feat. Incredible. There was, a, there was a country called Fiji, little island country, Fiji. Yep. And uh, it had been colonized by the British. And so you had um, the ethnic Fijians, who were the native people there, and then you had a lot of Indian people who were brought in as workers. So somewhere in the 1990s, you know, they had achieved independence decades before. And somewhere in the 1990s, they start to have an ethnic civil war. People start to kill each other. It's bad. Like it, but it hadn't been that bad before. 
And what a lot of social scientists pointed to was that the population was shifting. Yeah. That it used to be, I forget which what, what it was, but basically one ethnic group had 60% of the population and the other 40% for basically forever. And then roughly in the 90s, it started shifting. And the group who was 40 started getting to 45, then 47, then 50. And the other group started going from 60 to 50. And then they went down to 49. And the other group was like at 51. And right when the other group was like at 40, 51, and there it's 60 down to 49. Boom. Yep. Yeah, I got a question for you, Marcus. Yes. So Latinos are, all I've been reading is the Latino vote is becoming increasingly more uh, conservative. There, there's more Latinos supporting Republicans. I can, I could speculate to you, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't done this research. But are they also becoming more homophobic? Are they becoming the ones that are leaning in the direction? Are they buying into the, if you wish, the polarization that these Ivy League conservative elites are, where they're almost, if you wish, becoming anti-immigrant in the sense of illegal immigrant? They're, that that becomes Thank an you. issue within Thank the Latino you. community. So, and are they fed up with you know? Oh my God, they're gonna I'm gonna have to declare my pronoun. And these blacks, you know, with the, you know, all of a sudden they got the George Floyd thing. And is is do you think that the trend in conservatism within the Latino population is them buying into the elite conservative narrative? of it's us against them. I, I don't. Um, okay, good. So I am a progressive. And even when I was a Republican, I believed in climate change and diversity and women's rights. And I would go on conservative radio stations and say undocumented immigrants are great for the California economy. Boy, did that get me into fights with other conservatives. So I just want to point that out. Latinos are natural conservatives, just culturally. They're very religious. They're very pro-military. They're very pro-family. Uh, and they're generally more conservative um, anyway. So the, on religion. What about why, why in the last 10 years has there been a shift? I, I agree with everything you think. So they are very Catholic, et cetera, et cetera. Culturally, they're conservative. But they've always been the as much as blacks almost, the backbone of the Democratic Party. True. So, so what right. I'm asking you, Marcus, is what's happened in the last 10 years, five years, that has caused this potential shift? So what's, what's happened is that you've had a lot. That's a good question. I think what happened is the grand epiphany. You had so many Latinos come here and it was, hey, if you're Latino, you got to vote Democratic, right? Unless you were Cuban. That's been the understanding right. going way back. Um, and I, I think what happened is you you finally started getting so many Latinos here, and I'm third generation, and you started getting enough people who were Latin and also understood American politics really, really well. A lot of first generation Latinos, they they barely understand the government system. I mean, a lot of Americans barely understand the government system. So a lot of first generation Latinos barely understand it. So you started getting a larger group that had been here longer and had more people um, understanding it like... Um, Julian and his brother out of Texas, who were two top uh, Democrats, they were Latinos, and they 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 were Harvard or Ivy League trained, and um, their parents came from Mexico, but they were totally Americanized to, with all the elitism. I think what's happening is you're starting to get Latinos aware that they don't always have to be Democrats, that the Democrats have kind of used them as a, a wedge or a thing to vote on that they don't always get what they want from Democrats. I think uh, the big shift was, and you won't see this in the mainstream media, but I would say it was during Obama. Um, a lot of Latinos knew Obama could have passed immigration reform. He chose to go with health care. He chose to make Latinos the secondary issue and go with health care. He's basically admitted that after he got out of president and said, you know, I can't do everything. We had to do these things. That's why I did DACA. But there's a lot of Latinos who knew you know, we've never had immigration reform since Reagan. It's going on uh, 50 years now. Basically, you have to go back half a century to see when America said we're going to allow a lot of you guys in. Obama chose not to do it. He did health care first. 
There was a major Latino in Congress who was outright criticizing him for that. That guy was forced to lose his job because the Dems pulled the support. You'd also notice during the last four years of Obama presidency, Obama was getting massively criticized by Latinos. But yeah, Latinos he had now believe that Trump is going to further their ethnic interests. Well, well I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. So uh, even though DACA was going on and that was good, you'd hear about Latinos love Obama for DACA. What you did not hear in the news, for whatever reason, was that Obama was deporting more people than any president before him. And Latinos knew that. And so there was, if you actually talked to real Latinos on the ground, they were mad at Obama the last four years. You would never see that in TV or in print, but if you actually went to the Latin community, they're like, DACA's great. This guy's pulling us out at a faster race than, uh, rate than even the racist Republicans. So there was that awareness, and you didn't want to push on immigration. You pushed us as a second tier. So some Latinos started waking up and they're going, okay, well, maybe the Democrats aren't racist and maybe they're better than the Republicans. But we had this idea that, you know, we're going to get whatever we want. And, and clearly that didn't work out. Um, Trump came along. Trump tapped into a sentiment that has always been there with Latinos. I went to Texas. I'm 46. I remember going to Texas when I was 16, 30 years ago. We called them blanquitos. Now they're called vendidos. In African-American parlance, they call them Uncle Tom's racial sellouts. So in the Latin community, we've always had about 25% of the population wanted to basically act white so that they, the idea is that if I start tearing down other Latin people, white people who are racist will like me better. That's the right. theory. And so we called them uh, Blanquitos, little white person. Now the term is vendidos, which means um, shop owner who sold out of goods, literally sell out. And so those are racial sellouts. There's always been Uncle Tom's in the African-American community. We've always had, we call them Tio Tacos. Uh, there's always been racial sellouts. So when I heard Trump got 25% of the Latin vote and I go, 25% of Latinos were always racial sellouts who thought that by basically spitting on their own people, they can move up. That's all that happened. He just no, tapped into that racist that that that's are, always been there. Yeah, are those 25% buying into the uh, the polarization? You know, they, if they end up putting other people down that somehow or another that makes them feel better about themselves. Yes. Yes, they right. are. So they're, they're buying into the very yes. thing that, you know, the Ted Cruz's of the world want them to, are selling them. Um, some of it. Some of it is, yes, some of them are sellouts. However, some of them are just Republicans. And while I can't go back to being a Republican because I think Donald Trump was so racist, not all Latinos agree with that. There are some Latinos, like in Texas, I think her name was Mirna Flores, who won a congressional seat for Republicans. That was not about embracing racism. That was just about typical Republican values matched with typical Latino values. Um, right. Although, so there are sellouts and then there are just kind of conservative Latinos. Um, the, the sellouts are buying the racial stuff. The other ones aren't. I think they're naive and they think, well, the Republican Party isn't that racist. You know, people just hating on Trump and the Republican Party is that racist. So I, I would say they're misguided, but they're not motivated by polarizing. They're more motivated about coming here and building themselves up and providing for their family. And they think the Republican Party sometimes says things that allow that uh, to happen more. For example, um, in California, we had the recall election and against Gavin Newsom. And that was right during COVID. A lot of Latinos voted against Newsom and for him to be removed, not because they're Republicans, because they work. They have side jobs with cash economies. And when COVID came, you can't have your side job, your side construction, your side hair business or whatever. So a lot of them lost money. So they voted against that. Gavin Newsom went on TV and said, if you don't back me in the um, election, you're a white supremacist. My mom is Mexican and didn't back him because she caught, he cost jobs, but she called a white supremacist for that. So there's a little bit of, you know, if we don't do what you white people tell us to do on the Democratic side, then we're garbage and we're gone. You know what? Screw you guys. I'm going to go vote Republican. Right. I'm not saying I feel that way, but 
but I'm saying I've seen other Latinos say that. And when you're called a white supremacist by the governor of California because you want to protect your jobs, doesn't help. Right. Doesn't feeds right into Republican talking points. Right. So makes you sound like you're an Ivy League elitist who expects brown people to just snap too because you got a dim attached to your arm rather than you saying i will fight for latino votes and make sure that i give latin voters more than the other party like almost every other political group gets right so i think people are just becoming aware most latin people don't know politics but you're starting to see second and third generation people who are starting to get it and they're starting to wise up and go hold on just because the democrats said they're going to give us everything doesn't mean we'll actually get everything and I don't think that sophistication existed maybe 10 years ago. That's you know, just my I, opinion. You know, as long as the elite Republicans feed the narrative, I, I believe that we're going to have increasing polarization within the Latino community, within the United States. And it's, it's not that I'm excluding either I think that what happens is that these politicians make it legitimate for people to voice uh, homophobic or racist or whatever terms you want to use. Yeah. And, um, you know, basically uh, make others the problem. Thank you. And um, if, if people are going to buy into that narrative and then they turn to the social media, that only, you know, I don't think that the social media is the cause of the polarization. I, I think that the social media is a um, affirmation of what people are already believing. So if you feel that, you seek it out and then you become siloed. But I don't think the social media is causing what we're experiencing in terms of this incredible blowback where you can't talk about race any longer in college. So, and, you know, then, and I want to make that clear because I, when I read a, a lot of the, you know, newspaper, they all blame it on. Uh, I was going to ask you, I was going to say that. Yes. Many people saying uh, just for the sake of debate, social media is the cause of all of it. And right, if we just got social media, it goes away. I, I agree with that. I mean, when we, when I was a kid, it was Walter Cronkite, or Dan Rather, or or uh, you know ABC and NBC, Tom Pro, whatever, sure. right? And so we don't have that homogenization where there would be very slight differences among the three. But that doesn't have that. This isn't causing the polarization, and and so you know the way out of this isn't to focus on somehow or another free speech on the internet. Uh, those kinds of issues is to address the fundamental problem in terms of the white whites feeling a diminished sense of their ability to control the narrative of what it means to be an American. And so, you know, the way out of this is to for the Democratic Party to address making white people feel as if their gains are not at the expense of themselves. Right. And so what I what I wrote, I don't know if it was in this editorial or not, but I, what I wrote was that, you know, if if you feel it's us against them, then you believe in a zero sum society. Yes. Where every game that. that someone makes is at someone else's expense. And what Reagan did and what the Democrats need to do is to sell the message that the economy expanding floats everybody's boat. It may do so a little unequally, and that's why we need laws to, to adjust across racial and ethnic and, and uh, sexual identity categories. But the bottom line is that yet if the message that is healing, if you wish, is to say, look at if you allow blacks to gain, they may generate the cure for cancer that saves your lives. So instead of you being so narrowly focused on this, this fear of losing control, think about it as an expanding economy, expanding music, expanding medicine, et cetera, et cetera. The more people that are participating fully to their ability, the greater everybody's uh, benefits are going to be. 
And so I, I, if I was going to advocate and end with, you know, well, what's the solution to this is for them to come back and say, don't fall for this trap of us against them. That's a zero sum game. And that's not true. If we have an expanding economy and if everybody is, is fully participating in the economy to their maximum ability, there is no reason for you to be worried because they, what they generate is going to enrich your, your life. And that's, right. you know, I think that that kind of message uh, is a message for people to feel that they can open the door to your Latino gains. So homo, to, uh, to the, uh, the uh, you know, the, uh, I, the blacks gaining the, uh, the gay having their pronouns, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's not a threat. It's just a growth. I, I remember uh, there was a hip hop uh, CEO called Russell Simmons. And in the 1990s, you had a lot of shootings between um, hip hop artists on the left coast, on the west coast and the east coast. Uh, uh, Notorious B.I.G. and uh, Tupac Shakur. Um, and Russell Simmons was the CEO who was trying to sell music. And he got a lot of east coast and west coast rappers together in, in a room. And this was advertised on MTV. And what he told them was, you guys are killing each other because you think there's a limited market of customers for rap. This was in the 90s. And he goes, the rap industry is going to explode by 300%. It's going to be bigger than any of you can ever imagine. It's going to be global and gigantic. And he was right, but nobody could see it. Rap was a relatively right. small percentage of the music market at that time. And he's going... Picture us going global like Simmons was seeing where rap was when Obama was president 15 years later. And he goes, you guys are fighting over nothing. The pie is going to get bigger. You don't need to fight. Right. So I, I see that principle uh, with what you're saying. My I want to get back to something, though. If you feel that you seek it out. So the racism was always with the people. Social media is not the problem. I feel like you're saying. It's no, not social elite. media exacerbates an underlying. Okay, it, it's it's a fundamental problem, and but I don't think it causes someone to be racist. I think racists seek out and affirm. That's what I'm getting. At. That's so the what causal I'm direction at. isn't the media down; it's the person selected. Okay, because that there's a lot of experts on political polarization, and they say the the people are gentle sheep, the elites make them racist, make them turn that way. And then they do that because that's what they see the elites do. And I go, Donald Trump didn't make people racist. There was already racism going on. And he figured out if I throw red meat right to that, they'll come running. Correct. That's the people signaling to the elites, not the elites signaling to the people. Well, I think the, the, the elites, like I said, are fully aware of what will motivate the white folk. Okay. And so they have learned from the, you know, Lee Atwaters, et cetera, that playing the race card motivates the white vote. So the base of Donald Trump is are whites, white males particularly. So I believe that he is orchestrating a, uh, a, a movement that furthers his political self-interest at the expense of the polarization of our country. That makes sense. So he, he is taking advantage of and legitimating feelings that people, you know, have been trying to say that's not appropriate. So he's given them license to, to feel what they felt may have had some white guilt about there's no white guilt anymore it's like <laughs> i'm right and god damn it i'm right yep and screw you yep and so and that's that's you know the cause of the that's the cutting edge literally of the polarization and I, I, for the record not a trump fan made my mom cry so um we'll leave it there the, the question I want to, there's two questions I want to ask you. One is, um, and we're winding up, but I, this is the question I really want to ask you. I was bringing up the Fiji model and you said, yeah, that seems to make sense. So you have one ethnic group, 60% of the population, another group's 40. And roughly when they're starting to shift 
51 49 there's a lot of problems the the fiji situation didn't seem to calm down because of changes in government learning about democracy it it seemed to change when the demographics went from 60 40 back to 60 40 like one group was at 40 percent of the population and when they moved up to 60 percent of the population and the original majority group was now clearly a minority that's when it seemed to kind of stop it was like you've lost the other groups the dominant group you're no longer the dominant group but this whole period where it was like 45 percent of the population versus 55 percent of the population 49 percent versus 51 well, there's actually, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but I've read the research on uh, racial climate within schools. You know, what kind of composition within the student body creates the greatest level of racial conflict? And it's similar to what you're saying mm. that when you have, when you're like three uh, percent, and the rest are ninety-seven percent white, you know, at least in terms of the climate itself. It's, you know, those 3% may be feeling it, but the climate itself is more or less stable. People aren't uh, aggravated. And then when it's like 80% the minority, uh, there's less aggravation. But when you get into that 40%, like you were saying, that's when, if you wish, you know, there is no clear normative order. Right. And, you know, who who really is controlling the um, prom? You know, when I was in high school, way back, to give you my age, we actually had a black prom and a white prom. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so yeah. Uh, when you get in that 40%, who's going to, once again, control the cultural definition of what it means to be a high school in the in that particular high school so yeah and then i don't but i i don't know you know i don't know if i look down the road you know in 2050 when whites are a statistical minority i don't see uh unless there is a, a strong progressive movement or something i don't necessarily see whites giving up power or their desire for control thank you that's what i was getting at that's what i was wondering is that uh, because besides fiji the article that i wrote where i predicted america was going to get more racist even though i thought clinton was going to win also pointed at 1990s california if you go back to the 1990s california it was rough that was proposition 187 no medical care services undocumented um uh, let's get rid of all bilingual programs um, let's have uh, America first. So there was a big, big culture clash in the 1990s. In fact, when Trump came out and was starting so many racial issues in 2016, 2017, Gavin Newsom of California said, California went through this. We just went through it 30 years earlier in the 1990s. And if you go to the 1990s, guess what's happening? White people in California are at the, you know, they're going from 55 down to 50%. And everybody else is gone. So roughly you start seeing, and again, never got better throughout the 1990s. It only started getting better in the early thousands when white people were clearly the minority. Like they were clearly the minority. You had lost. You're not going to be the majority. It's over. Stop thinking about that. Those days of the 1960s, 70s are over. So we did all these political moves in the 1990s, didn't fix it. Things got fixed when the demographics shifted and white people had to accept that the, you know, you're the minority and you need to start acting like everybody else is a minority. I think it's been great because now we're a majority minority community and more people of accepting. There is a problem with some racism towards white people. I don't support that. Minorities can be racist too. But if we're right that the Fiji model and the California model both say, hey, this 51, 49% isn't good. And we have to look at that. America doesn't get to majority minority till 20 years from now. Correct. Are we going to have two more decades of racism and racial problems? Well, again, I, I, I perceive the fact that these Harvard educated, Princeton educated, that if they're going to orchestrate polarization, it's going to be problematic. You know, if, if the Democrats can't 
create a message or narrative that allows whites to feel that they have their interests in uh, in place as well. Maybe not at least as equal as they do the minorities. It's going to be problematic, and you're going to if you're going to continue to get demigods as presidents that are going to foster greater polarization. At some point, though, Marcus, you're probably right that whoever's running at some point will have to understand that they're going to have to appease the minorities that now make up the majority of their vote. And at that point, you know, uh, there may be a resolution to this us against them. But that's a long way away for us. I just wonder what the next two decades hold. I see people go, Trump was an aberration. Um, we'll go back to it. And I go, no, there was racism during Obama. Uh, Obama didn't really want to talk about it because he wanted to keep America united. I get that. But I also thought it, it also made a mistake. I'm not condemning him. I believe he did what he had to do because that's what as president you're supposed to do. But I also believe we had less recognition that racism was there than we could have had. Um, right. And I get as president, you know, he's got to keep everybody together. I think that's what presidents are supposed to do. I think George W. Bush tried, even though I just I don't like him. But, you know, Trump was like, no, you know, we're not with you. Uh, but I think we missed something. I think we missed a recognition that it wasn't all hunky dory. Um, and then I think Trump being able to activate so many racists so quickly. I remember the media when he was first going out to the Midwest, they're going, why, why is a guy in a business suit and a helicopter having all these rednecks show up at his rallies and act like they're brothers with him? Like they couldn't get it. They were like, he's corporate America. They're red state America. How do they, they it's were like tied the on Reagan, racism. The union voters voted for Reagan. They were tied on, they were like, you know, they were tied on racism. They, they knew what he was signaling. It mentioned to them immediately. So I don't think you could have got that many people riled up that quick unless there was racism there. And if it is there, and we already had a black president, and it didn't fix it, then maybe it's not reasonable to think America is going to be different than places like California 1990 and Fiji. And maybe it's more reasonable to think that America is going to be like every other place on the planet that went through an ethnic civil war where their populations went like this. Maybe we're more human than we are just American. Um, right. And there is no way out. In which case I tell people, buckle up, because we got two more decades of this. And just if Donald Trump's, I guess it gets down to this. I don't I, believe Marcus, I got to intervene. It's not just Trump. Thank you. I live in Florida. And Trump didn't make it illegal for me to talk about critical race theory. DeSantis has. So, you know, Trump may not get elected. DeSantis might get elected, and he is more fervent on the polarization, you know, than actually Trump is. So, really? Can you say that again? Really? Oh, I, I, there's no doubt about it. Like I said, he, he shipped, I paid $13 million for Latino immigrants to be shipped to Cape Cod out of my own tax dollars, Right. Trump was building a wall. This guy's using immigrants as political ploys to get himself reelected. He just oh, reinstated the death penalty for uh, child rape. And I think one person in the history of the United States that was white, that raped a black person, got executed. This guy is, his war on woke is more racially and ethnically and on the uh, gay community more divisive than Trump. So, you know, I think I think we're doing a disservice and giving him much more credit than he deserves. It's also, you know, all these guys like the Santis are using the same tactics of polarization. But, you know, if you wish, the Santis is trying to outdo Trump on creating polarization. And he, you don't see DeSantis talking about pocketbook issues. Trump at least talks about pocketbook issues, although it's in an inflammatory way. So, Marcus, give Trump his due deserve, but don't 
make him out to be the villain because there's a lot of people that are going to take over when he when he uh, falters that are going to be potentially outdo Trump. Uh, I'm saying this partly as a joke, partly not. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for bringing that up. Folks at home, this is why I love doing the interviews. I learn things. Maybe I'm totally wrong, Professor. Could be. I don't see anyone saying that. I agree with you and what you say makes sense. But if what you're saying is true, then I find that even more scary. Oh, because absolutely. the national media says Did it's Trump say Trump. anything about don't say gay? He didn't pass a law about... Well, how come no one's cluing in on this? I don't see anyone in the mainstream news going, hey, folks, as bad as Trump was, DeSantis is actually the mass. Trump is the is the uh, bachelor's candidate and DeSantis is the Ph.D. Uh, scholar at Culture Wars. I don't see people. I agree with you. And he's got a Harvard and Yale degree. Why aren't people aware that DeSantis is pushing Culture Wars even worse than Trump? I think they are. I just, you know, okay. at this point, he, he's not okay. as viable. But as soon as if Trump gets indicted or falls out of the race, the spotlight's going to be on him. And, the, you know, whether or not he resonates fully with Trump's base will be his only issue. You know, that, that'll be the issue. Can he garner what Trump leaves behind is, is, you know, essentially his challenge. But he's trying to outdo Trump on when it comes to the cultural war. This is where woke has come to die. I remember him saying that. Uh, so we already have a Republican Party that might be moving on past Trump, but is still responding to culture wars. Because that's the ticket that sells. So even if Trump, let's say tomorrow, poof, Trump disappeared. He goes to another universe. Nobody ever sees him again. Everybody suddenly forgets his name. We still have Trump, Trump ideology here. Because those people know that the fundamental issue in the United States is no one wants to be told by an other group, if you're white, we don't want other groups to tell us how to live our lives. And as long as that remains in place and these elite Harvard educated politicians exploit that, it's going to be divisive. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> I don't care if it's Haley. I don't care if it's the Santis. I don't care who it is. As long as they know that that's how they can mobilize the white vote for their own personal gain to get elected. Trouble ahead. What did the Grateful Dead say? Trouble ahead, trouble behind. Okay, that's that's really, really sobering. Um, thank you. I don't, I don't think people are as aware of that as possible. Uh, they should. Well, because out here in California, I'm sorry, but here, here in California, people think Trump's going to be an orange jumpsuit and everything snaps back to this place. You know, we lived in this perfect utopia before Trump. And if he could just go to prison, everything would be great. And I'm, I'm like, that's a fantasy. That sounds like a children's fantasy. That doesn't sound like the real world. Uh, problems don't get fixed that neatly or that quickly. One man can't make 40 million people suddenly think horrible ideas that they had never thought of before. That's just, that's ridiculous. So uh, nobody really wants to hear that out here. So that's why I wanted to ask you. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, have you ever heard of the big sort? The big what? The big sort. Um, let me type that up. So it's this idea that since 1992, Americans have been separating themselves into ideologically like-minded communities. So this is the uh, Weinstein thing. Uh, this is related to it. This is related to it. This is by a man called Bill Bishop, and he he wrote the book The Big Sort in the '90s. And what it was saying is that since 1992, uh, basically he was looking at presidential elections, and he was saying when you look at presidential elections, and when you look at the counties at the presidential elections. You have more what he called landslide election counties, meaning one candidate, the Democrat, wins by 20 percentage points more than the Republican. And he was pointing out, and this is in the map that's on your screen right now. So the top left, the top left is the 1992 election. I know it doesn't say that, but the top left is. Blue means 
Don't even run here if you're not a Democrat. Democrats always get 20 percentage points more than the Republicans. Red means don't even run here if you're not a Republican. Republicans always get 20 percentage points more than the other. It's called a landslide election county. And if you look at the map in the top left, mm -hmm. and then you go right down right. to the bottom, gray means competitive. Sometimes we elect John McCain. Sometimes we like what a young Barack Obama is saying. It depends on where we are, where we think America is, who has the right message for the country at the time. Pure democracy. And you can see the gray is almost, almost completely wiped out by 2016, 2020. We almost have no competitive districts. Every district is a hardcore Republican or hardcore Democrat district, and we become super polarized. He was pointing to the early 1990s as the beginning of this, roughly around the middle of Clinton's uh, mm. presidency. And there is some evidence that this is about racism. This is about Bill Clinton came in as president, and I'm asking if you agree or not. Bill Clinton came in as president and said for the first time, I want a cabinet that looks like America. And what he meant was not white people. He meant a diverse cabinet. He was the first president to do that, first president to make that a big deal. I'm going to have minorities in my cabinet. He did a lot of appointments, appointed a lot of African-American people, a lot of African-American judges. And then around 94, 95, he did welfare reform. Right. And welfare reform, although it was an agreement with the Republicans, was seen by some super conservatives as giving free stuff to lazy black people. Not right. my opinion. Not my opinion. What Republicans were saying at the time, I want to be clear, not my opinion, what they were saying at the time. So if you look at the fact that Bill Clinton was big on diversity, nobody had really seen that before. He's pushing it in a way nobody had seen before, big time. And you're looking at uh, welfare reform, um, which is viewed by some conservatives as giving free stuff to dark skinned people. The big sort seems to start happening around that time. We start having people going, I don't I'm hardcore Republican or hardcore Democrat. Is it possible that people started sorting themselves ideologically because of a reaction to racism? Bill Clinton comes along and he says, we're a diverse America. We're going to be a diverse America. We're going to be a country that accepts a diverse America. And maybe some people just freak out and they can't handle that. Well, idea. I haven't seen any data that would support a increase all the questionnaires that measure racism uh i haven't seen any data that shows uh except you know during the obama period a radical or a significant increase in the overall level of racism within the united states and you know it, it's a really complicated question but uh, the data actually show that you know what they call jim crow racism diminished where there was a biological difference between the race um the shift in racism is really uh around the issue now that we attribute racism to an inability for blacks to achieve so that's kind of like a more palatable version of racism so irish came blah blah and blacks remain poor other groups have done it asians have done it why don't blacks right um so the data don't support uh the idea that somewhere or something in 1990 all of a sudden the level of racism within the united states has increased so okay. I, I kind of don't have any uh, data to support this person's argument that the level of racism has increased. You know, the way in which politicians may have used racism may have changed. Uh, and that could be, you know, somewhat the cause of what you're seeing. If you see this map, Almost all the areas that are red are more rural and the blues are mostly clustered in urban areas. Yes, sir. So yes, that, sir. you know, the, again, the message in the way in which Bush, Lee Atwater, et cetera, 
orchestrated the use of race to get that blue collar voter, that rural voter, I think could be what you're seeing here rather than all of a sudden there's a fundamental increase in the animosity that whites have towards blacks. And this is based upon surveys and questionnaires and it didn't show an increase in people, I guess, showing or indicating an increase in racist behavior around the 1990s. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, affirmative action, you know, was a dominant issue in the 1990s onward, right? And, you know, the opposition to affirmative action generally is along racial lines, not entirely, but you know, where whites don't, again, they don't want blacks to get a leg up on them. And so, uh, you know, Bush, and et cetera, th those folk use that to their own end. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're increasingly becoming in aggregate numbers, a more racist society. I would just say that we as a country are using race in more divisive ways. Interesting. Not more racist, but the elites, I guess, on the right are using race in a more divisive way. I don't think they're converting you. They're not converting me. <laughs> no, they're not going to convert me. I, I, and they're not going to convert me either. So, but they are uh, using it so that people will uh, vote for them. Yeah, and it's sad. I really thought they were going to have to reach out and bring in minorities, and it seems like the strategies to gerrymander and change the voting scheme and just hold on to that solid um, ostracized white vote as far as they can, um, right. almost like a, a death clutch. It reminds me of the uh, when the Nazi empire fell, you still had a couple Nazis running around in the mountains for another year or two fighting because they're like no we're never giving up you know we could and they were dead enders and there was no that didn't end until they basically shot them all i'm not suggesting violence at all i'm just saying if you look at history there were some people who were never going to accept the war was over until they died right um, sorry i i'm not endorsing that maybe maybe 50 25 50 years from now the progressives will be saying if you don't like it here leave that that could be that you know you might see the flip right we see a lot of flips in in history um well what's her name that to end with that didn't green say she all she wanted to create yes a, a separate country within the united states for and a that's little... that's what partly started this discussion series because i saw i was watching the news talk about marjorie taylor green's famous tweet on president's day where she said red and blue can't live together we have to have a national divorce um Right. And, and I didn't think the media was doing as in-depth the coverage they should have. Um, well, because as long as they, you get the mountains and the beaches, I'm good. What? As long as we get the beaches and the mountains. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I they, think they could have Odessa. They could have Odessa, Texas. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's where the Mexican side. Is from, <laughs> yeah, uh, technically Tejano. Um, Okay, winding down, let me ask you two questions. Here's the first one. You're not you. You're not me. You're a third person watching this video. They're watching this video and they thought, well, that's a good video. There's a lot of material. I learned a lot, a lot of back and forth, corrections of information, a lot of learning. I, I'm struggling to remember it all, but there was this one thing the professor said. And you know, while I was struggling to remember the everything they talked about in this video, it's five days later after I watched that video, and I can't get this one thought out of my head that the professor said. What is that one thought you want a total random person you'll never meet to not be able to stop thinking about five days from now? Well, the, the takeaway is that the, there's Harvard-educated Republican elites that are orchestrating racial divisiveness for their own political purposes. That's the takeaway. Um, I hope that you found this was a fair interview. We didn't do gotcha journalism. 
uh, we didn't put words in your mouth. Um, I hope you found it was like a fair interview. Is there anybody else that uh, you don't have to, but we always ask, is there anybody you could recommend? Is there anybody you know who might be willing to be part of an honest conversation and is thoughtful and, and could talk about political polarization in any aspect, criminology, policy, foreign policy? Yeah, there's a, there's a Duke, prof I'll email you, there's a Duke professor uh, that um, writes about colorblindness, uh, and I'll send you his name. I mean, he's phenomenal. I really appreciate that. Can we, uh, can we, Marcus, get a copy of the video to, of the, our interview to share? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to email you a copy of the video in about an hour. Okay. And then it can go to anybody and we'll go from there. I really appreciate it. Uh, is there anything you wanted to say? Was there something we didn't cover? Was there a question you had? Was there something you wanted to express more and you, you felt you didn't have enough time? No, I mean, uh, we could have other conversations. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to. On polarization. On, on polarization. <laughs> I'll send you another one of my editorials and see if that sparks another conversation or something. But uh, I, I would love to have you back and talk about where you think race is going in America because it's a uh, academic and personal topic for me. Right. So we, we can we can. We can go further on our next. Uh, our next we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. I just. I, I, I guarantee you, Marcus, that there'll be a whole lot more for us to talk about in the relatively near future, too. What do you mean? You know, the DeSantis and you know the um, whatever other policies start to happen. Who could have predicted uh, three years ago that the Black Lives Matter would cower? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not me. Not, not me. me. I, I didn't see that happening. Uh, they kind of imploded all of a sudden. Um, yeah. So I, I guarantee you, when you get all been out of shape about whatever happens, give me a ring and we'll talk about it. Okay, I will. So <laughs> you're not predicting smooth sailing in the ethnic ocean of America in the future? Uh, no. I think maybe we'll have, oh, okay. More pro things are going to get worse, maybe a little bit more heated in the future before it gets better. Yep. Okay. We'll leave it there. You heard it here. Thank you, professor, for coming out. Thank you for being here. Thank you for answering all the questions. We really appreciate it. I will, uh, I'll email you a copy of the video shortly and we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Thank Bye -bye. you. Appreciate it. <clears throat>